We wanted to see whether the groupings that we saw on our PCA results um, can be translated into clusters by clustering that correspond to the labels of our crabs that we've collected. So, um, for example, if I use k-means clustering, um, one parameter for k-means is the number of um, clusters that I want to get. So, my classes um, would be uh, k-means of PCAS dollar $x over 2 and 3. And these are the classes that I get back. Now, if I suspect that my um, clustering was successful, I would, I would expect one class to be um, exclusively in the column, in, in the rows 1 to 50, the next class exclusively in the columns um, 51 to 100, and so on. So, so I can just plot that. <clears throat> so what this plots now is the value of the clustering vector, i.e. the index, which is a number between 1 and 4, as a function of the row index. So in, I, I do actually see that, you know, somewhere um, my um, first 50 have been preferentially clustered into cluster number 2. Uh, my next 50 have preferentially been clustered into cluster number 3. Um, my next 50 have been preferentially clustered into 4. And also some 1s here, and so the, the clustering was not perfect according to that. Um, and the last 50 were also clustered into cluster number 3. So how do I interpret that? So remember, these were um, blue males, I believe, blue males, blue females, orange males, and orange females. So my clustering is doing very well, distinguishing males from females, but it does not distinguish well between blue and orange females. So I've used only column two and three. What does it look like if I use column um, one and two? That's kind of all over the place. Kind of strange. Um, what happens if I use, instead of 2 and 3, um, 2 to 5? So all of the columns. So now I'm adding information. Does that give me better clustering? What do you think? Is that better? Yes. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I'm, I'm getting worse results for, for the blue males, but now I'm clearly distinguishing blue from orange females. So the, one of my PCA columns um, apparently, information about the structure between the blue and orange females is represented in PCA column 4 and not in PCA column 2 and 3. So does it get better if I remove 5? So just using 2 to 4. Not really. So now we have uh, a first cluster that that has more information and so on. So in this case, um, for the clustering to be successful, I actually, or the best clustering that I can have here, actually relies on information from all um, principal components, two, three, four, and five. That improves the clustering. But that's uh, four dimensions, and we, we can't really visualize that well. So we've only looked at two-dimensional projections. 
and, and, and overlaps. But in order to cluster, we apparently need more information. What happens if I use all of them? Then again, this is all dominated by uh, the high correlation. So that gives me worse clustering. So this is clearly a case where removing the first principal component allows the data to be better separated. But other than that, removing additional principal components does not improve the results. On the contrary, it, uh, it degrades the results. Now, is that the same situ situation for um, what, what happens if I use the TS and E? What does that look like? Kind of. So my TS and E result seems to be better than any of the clustering results except for the one where I actually use all of the PC dimensions. So this is how we can start evaluating whether clustering actually works. If you have a sample with labels, then you can, you can, you can verify that your clustering algorithm builds cluster assignments that actually correspond to your biological labels. Um, in principle, any kind of a, of a project where you hope to do, to do clustering and cluster analysis uh, for this kind of work really relies on um, you validating your workflow first with you know, something like this. If I were to study crabs and I, I wouldn't be able to get my hands on, on some curated <coughs> samples with which I can test my workflows, you know, I, I would always get clusters. I mean, you always get clusters, but are they meaningful? In order to, for them to be meaningful, you need some labeled data to compare this with. So develop your workflow on known data and then apply to unknown data. You're not likely to be successful if you apply your workflow right away to unknown data and you have no good way of validating whether the results are correct. Yes? clustering on that, how, how can I validate the result? Um, because there are no labels. Like, yeah, if I was going to see whether or not I should be using the principal components or a TC dimensional direction yeah. and how many principal components to use. Yeah. So, um, well, if you were going to come to me in consulting this, the first question I would ask you, well, what are you going to do with the results anyway? How would you validate them? Uh, is it just to make an, an, an informative plot that you're going to publish? Or is this going to have some consequence? Are you going to follow up on that? If you say, well, yeah, we can follow up by you know, doing a longitudinal study or whatever. Maybe you need to do that for a subset before you actually, uh, well, longitudinal study. No, I'm not going <laughs> to say, just wait a few years and, and, and use that, uh, use, uh, look at your Cox plots. Um, another way to do it is find data from a similar situation where people are happy. And then train your algorithms or develop your algorithms with, with that similar data set in mind until you know that all your code is correct, that you understand your parameters, you understand what variables you can use to reproduce that, then employ it to, to your but there's no statistical test to apply like to those documents that score in order to, you know, <laughs> in your clustering or your... Well, it, 
segue to the next day, next thing that we're of course talking about, and that's cluster validation. Um, we can validate clusters. In the absence of biological knowledge, however, the validation really means mathematical validation. And that means, are my clusters well structured? Are there mathematical um, features that I can compute on my clusters that indeed show me members within a cluster are more similar to each other than uh, between members of different clusters? And um, that's cluster quality metrics. So if we have a number of methods, <coughs> um, we, we, can, we can ask, well, which one should ask, which one do we use? Which one is the best to use? So what, what we have here is a package, CL valid, which at least compares different methods systematically with each other and then applies um, metrics on how um, on, on, on what these what these cluster mean. Um, so the vignette here for CL valid speaks about validation measures that, that you can apply, internal measures, um, measures that reflect the compactness, the connectedness, and the separation of the cluster partitions, um, i.e. connectivity, um, Connectivity has a value between zero and infinity and should be minimized, so that value should be as small as possible. Then uh, silhouette width measures the degree of confidence in the clustering assignment. Um, silhouette width lies in the interval minus one to one and should be as large as possible. And the done index is the ratio of the smallest distance between observations not in the same cluster to the largest intradustal uh, uh, separation, has a value between zero and infinity, and also should be maximized. So you have these three indices that, that characterize, are my clusters compact? Are they well separated? And it can also do a number of, of other things. So um, <clears throat> if I run that on my data here, so remember these were the highest differentially expressed genes, and the question is, can I cluster them? So it starts fitting with a number of different clustering methods, hierarchical, k-means, and some methods that we, we haven't discussed here. and. Um, For each of the methods, it gives me connectivity done and silhouette values for assuming two clusters, assuming three clusters, assuming four clusters, and so on. So clustering this along um, uh, the different possibilities of clustering, and then what the optimal score is. So we, we just try it out, and then, then we look at what the optimal sc scores are um, for The connectivity, um, we want to maximize that, right? Or should be minimized? I, I can't remember. Let me check back here. Connectivity has a value between 0 and infinity and should be minimized. OK? So what I see here is that the clusters get, as the clusters get higher, um, usually the whole clustering gets worse in terms of the cluster metrics and the model algorithm is the worst of them all. Hierarchical uh, clustering seems to be, f be performing the best <laughs> overall um, along with Agnes clustering which seems to have the same values. So that's kind of, you know, that tells me m my data don't really cluster well. The best cluster that I can get is all of my data in the same pod. <clears throat> 
um, if I use, if I consider done, um, done should be maximized. So the largest clusters here, um, again, uh, hierarchically, and Agnes gives me the same. Uh, once again, um, number of clusters is, is, is two. Um, so the fewer clusters I define, the better it gets uh, for this one here. And simple hierarchical clustering al also does the best. And then silhouette width is between minus one and one, and I think the largest one, and again, hierarchical clustering is the best. And if I increase the number of clusters, um, my, my metrics get worse. So this is an example where I would be cautious about using clustering in the first place. Or it would say, the data that I've collected, i.e. the expression profiles, does not, does not support clustering here. Um, is that something that I'd expect? Is that just due to the vagaries of the clustering algorithms? Anyway, that doesn't work well. I would, I would expect clustering to work a lot better if I apply cluster valid to our um, TS and E data. Oh, you know, why not just run that? Should be easy enough to do. I hope I'm not going to break something again. Um, So we'll try between two and clusters of size between two and nine. I would expect that I get the best results with the best method for four clusters, because that's in my data. Um, the data that I'm clustering is uh, um, PCAS dollar X to to five, and using all these methods. Okay, never done this. I'm actually very excited. So what do we find here? Um, so this one should be minimized. Was it connectivity? I can never remember. Sorry. Connectivity, yeah, should be minimized. So uh, judging by connectivity, um, we kind of seem to be getting a dip around f four or five here. So this, this dip indicates that some, u some useful clustering is actually uh, going to be taking place around this region here. Um, with the done index, that should be maximized. I actually get a good observation that um, a cluster value around four peaks um, looks like something is actually happening here, especially with the model clustering algorithm. And um, with using silhouette width, something like um, five or six clusters or something like that gives the best cluster. Now, mind you, Giving me the best clustering does not necessarily mean giving me the best biological labels. It just means this is the way we can partition the data. If, my, if, if there happens to be, say, in my orange females, um, a subgrouping, um, like 
uh, motherly and grandmotherly orange females have different shapes. Um, the clustering might pick that up, but I, I would not have it in my, in, in my labels, right? So calculating cluster validities is also easy. Um, interpreting them is like anything with your data, um, something that you need to give a lot of thought to. So this is cluster validation. Um, now I've I've mentioned T S and E. I I would I would like to uh, apply T S and E briefly to our expression data because I'd I'd like to pick up on this this question. We we have many <coughs> plots on our, many points on our dots and often we want and we need to identify them. And I'd like to show you a few strategies to do that. Um, <clears throat> so this is T stochastic neighbor embedding for um, the cell cycle data. And there's a bit of structure we, we see, even though our clustering was not successful, we're usually very good at, at, at seeing uh, cluster structures. Um, we see clusters even if there aren't any. But I could say, well, maybe these are similar, and let's look at their expression profiles, and maybe this group is similar, and I'd like to see their expression profiles. Um, <clears throat> so. How do we, how, how can we do that? And I'm, I'm not even going to color them here, but the question is then how do I, how do I select from such uh, TS and E results? So the simplest um, thing that I can do is simply plot the row numbers as text and then gaze and, and uh, stare into my data and plot them as text. Right, so these are now the row numbers. And now I'd, I'd, I'd need to stare in that and then collect these row numbers to be able to figure out, um, well, what these groups are. So um, maybe if we make the labels a, little, a bit smaller, it becomes a little more visible. Um, at least I can start seeing and distinguishing things and um, we, can, we can do um, a parallel coordinates plot from the data that we see here, some data points that we're interested in. So for example, I could define a set one um, that I see here, 157, and I see row 74 and 223 and 219. And then I could say, well, some others are around in this region. Let's see if they're similar but different. Uh, 180, 110. One thirty nine and one seventy four. 
and then finally maybe take a few from this cluster down here as selection 3 um, 107 and 61 194, 209, and 208. So these are now three sets, and um, So this is the first set, and indeed, uh, they're similar. And the second set, indeed, again similar, but very different. And third set, um, on, a, on, a, on a different scale. Again, I see a different behavior but uh, from the other two. So that means, in principle, the separation that I get from my TSNE analysis really does show me uh, points that are close together in space and thus that are similar and that I can I can pull out this now that's something when you when you do your analysis on your on your data sets you could run a, um, a principal component or a TS and e something that plots your data points and then you can start looking into that and say do I have structure in my data does the structure make any sense? Is it, is it um, reasonable to see um, that my sample number one and my sample 17 uh, kind of look similar? Is, does that, they're close together on the, these plots. Is there any biology that would indicate that perhaps that indeed might, might uh, point to a cancer subtype or something like that? But of course, if you have a, long, long num a large number of samples just you know, staring into these things, um, would be um, very tedious. So can't we go in there and, and is there not an interactive way to identify points from plots? And yes, there is. And I'd, I'd, like, to, um, I'd like to show you that. So basically, um, there are two functions that we can use, identify and locator, and they give us interactive ways of using the mouse to, to, um, to identify uh, points in the plotting frame. So this, <clears throat> these were the points in our uh, TS and E plot, and if we if we type identify, then we can go and we can kind of click on these points that we might be interested in, and if we press escape or a different mouse button. we then get shown which points we actually chose. So now it becomes a lot easier to say, ah, these were 150, 64, and 145, and 113. So I could, um, <clears throat> I, I could easily 
um, write that down. But I don't need to because it's actually also in a vector. So I can, I can assign the results of using the identify function. So, um, and I can do that and actually plot the uh, parallel coordinates plot. Um, In in a, in a separate window, so open a second graphics window. So um, open a new graphics window here, and uh, I store its ID. I I call it I call it window two. <coughs> And um, there's something called focus. Initially, when I open a window, focus turns to that window. So if I plot something, it, it arrives in that window. If I want to return focus to my original plotting window, I need to say device set window one. So with device set window one or window two, I can put, I can address plotting in one window or the other window. works. Okay, so I get this this window on the side here. Um, for example, clicking this one here immediately gives me the parallel coordinates plot in this frame. Clicking the, his little brother on the side shows they're indeed similar slightly different scales, and so on. So this is a very interactive way of picking up data from plots, transforming them into another window, showing them, um, and displaying them, and 
by implication of the TSNE, I would expect that um, points in this region here are significantly different and have different behavior. So in this way, I can, I can further explore my plot. I can see what actually happened, what the, what the plot actually showed me um, in, 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 in the first place. And by exploring the internal structure of my plot, hopefully learn the important features and, and the important information in my data. So I'm sorry that, that a lot of um, this is a, is a bit broken. I'm, I need to update that script. I will post it back on GitHub as soon as it's updated, which probably should be today. I don't want it to languish around in this, in this broken state. Um, you can then go and experiment with it and, and, and play with it. If, if anything uh, is not clear or, or doesn't work, then feel free to email me about it. Um, <clears throat> the next section, but, but again, it, it suffers from the same thing. Um, shows how I can uh, plot a, a, some polygons around a cluster and then define everything that's within that cluster, which again makes it easy to pick out point sets from um, um, PCA or uh, model plots or, or, um, or TSNE plots. So as far as the clustering is concerned, I would, I would like to leave that for now and um, talk a little bit about um, statistics, just a little bit, um, in particular about <clears throat> the one question that, that that obviously haunts us after we've done our uh, exploratory data analysis, and that's the question, is any of this significant? So we need to wrap our head around what, what we mean by significant. What does significant mean? And significant in statistics um, is a concept that relies on p-values. So we have a probability of some event having happened. And if we know, if we have an idea about the distribution of observations in an event that we're not interested in, because it's you know, something that always happens, like we often call that the background distribution. If we know that distribution and then we observe an event, we can assign a probability to the sample that we've just observed being an example of the background distribution, or perhaps not. So the probability is, is the sample something that I've drawn out of the background distribution? Now, the background distribution is a distribution. It can take many values. So the question is, does the value that I'm observing, um, is that conceivably part of the background distribution? Or is something interesting happening here? We often call um, <clears throat> that background distribution the null hypothesis. So if nothing is interesting is going on, the null hypothesis is true. If something interesting is going on, then we would reject the null hypothesis because the probability that the null hypothesis um, is true for that one observation is small. So if that's very small. So, but what do we mean by the probability of a single observation? And what do we mean by very small in that case? And so, so what, what we mean by very small is actually purely uh, a matter of convention. It's a cultural convention. We call something s very small or highly improbable in the biomedical field if it has a probability um, of less than 5%. 
we call something that has a probability of less than 5% significant. We sometimes call something that has a probability of less than 1% highly significant. But there's no particular um, reason to, to assume that 5% is better than 6.237% to characterize what we are interested in, or that 1% is better than 0.83%. It's a cultural convention. However, it's a cultural convention that's widely adopted, and if you use different levels of probability to call something significant than 5%, you will have to have a lot of explaining to do to your manuscript editor. So, <clears throat> um, but that's, that's actually it means. 5% um, is just the value that the British statistician Ronald Fisher happened to propose for this purpose in um, 1925. And incidentally, so this is almost 100 years ago, incidentally Fisher himself then later said, well, maybe that wasn't such a great idea. Maybe we should, and we do, really be using different cutoffs for different purposes. But <clears throat> what's also really important is that this refers to a background distribution. It doesn't tell me whether um, an alternative hypothesis is true. It only tells me, or specifically it doesn't tell me which alternative hypothesis might be true. It only tells me something about whether the null hypothesis might be false. So what, what do we mean by um, <clears throat> the probability of an observation. So assume that I pick a random number with the random number generator for normal distributions, i.e. the Gaussian distribution. I, pin, I pick one number x. This corresponds to one observation. And now I print my number x And I get the value minus 0 0.896914546624981379 So this is one observation. What is now the probability of that observation? So this is what you're really talking about. You have an underlying distribution. You have a single observation. What's the probability of that observation? This is a small number perhaps a rational number, or you know, certainly a rational number, because it's somehow represented in, in binary on my computer. Um, the probability of that, if I extend this, the number of digits to infinity, is actually zero. So does that mean every single number, every single observation that I make is, is infinitely significant? Of course not. When I say the probability of an observation, I don't mean the probability of that observation. I mean by that the probability of an observation or something even more extreme than that as compared to my reference distribution. So that's something that, that I'd like to illustrate. Um, <clears throat> Let's first draw a million random values from our standard, standard normal distribution. One million values, instantaneous. And let's look at what the distribution looks like by looking at this histogram. Um, the value that we've drawn previously is is still this, this one number. And we can say, well, where does this number fall on that distribution? 
This is, this is where that number falls. Now we can ask, how many values are smaller than this one? And that's 184,491s. Or conversely, the number of values that are larger than this one is something like uh, 720,000. So um, let's color the bars to illustrate that. And this was our red line. So we have numbers that are smaller and numbers that are larger. And that now defines what we call the probability of our observation. Um, because it's the ratio of this number and the ones that are more extreme divided by everything else. So the probability here um, in, in 1 million would be something like 18%, um, p-value of 18%. So the shape of our histogram confirms that the, our, our norm has actually returned values that are distributed according to a normal distribution. So normal tables tell us that 5% of our values, i.e. the cutoff for significance, um, should lie approximately two standard deviations away from the mean. So this is centered on zero with a standard deviation of one. So um, values that are greater than 2 or, or smaller than 2 should have um, a 5% standard deviation. So let's, let's see. How many of these values have, um, how many of the values are greater than 1.96, i.e. lying 2 standard deviation outside? So this is um, 24,986. Wait, uh, we, didn't we just say 5%? So this is 2.5%. not 5%. So why? Well, <clears throat> what you have to, to consider is whether we're doing these comparisons in a two-sided way or in a one-sided way. If I'm looking only for things that are larger than the extreme value, uh, l larger than, than, than the rest of the values, I, I consider a one-sided observation. And then my 5% value would be somewhere inside of the two standard deviations. But if I say, well, I don't know. They could be smaller. They could be larger. I don't know that. Then, if I'm only looking for extreme values, I have to look at the two sides separately. And then my cutoff is at 2.5% of larger and 2.5% of smaller values. So considering absolute values. Um, <clears throat> So I can, I can use quantiles to count how many values in my, in my distribution are larger or smaller than a given value. So um, the quantile for probabilities that are at the 0.95 boundary is the number 1.6449 or something like 1.65, uh, 1.645. And if we, if we actually calculate the sum of these quantiles at that level of 0.95, we get 50,000 as expected. So this is, this is how we can um, how, how we can look into a distribution and simply from the distribution tell us what the probability or what the significance of an individual observation is. <clears throat> now, if we know a functional form for our underlying um, distribution, uh, because there's a mechanism, a well-understood physical mechanisms um, over which we can integrate, then we can approximate these counts as areas under the integral. So the integral of the function um, on one side of the cutoff divided by the integral of the entire function gives us uh, the probability. 
but many probability distributions can't be integrated numerically, especially the normal distribution can't, uh, can't be integrated analytically, um, but, uh, and, and the normal distribution can't. So especially things where you can start looking up tables like normal distributions or T distributions or whatever, um, make assumptions about the independence of data that are certainly often violated in biological data. So whether it's even possible to come up with a good description of the, um, of the underlying distribution is, is a very difficult question to answer. But we need it because if we don't have an idea of what our underlying distribution is, we can't even say whether any value is significant. So what comes to our rescue here is something that we call um, empirical p-values. Um, so we can often simply run a simulation, random resampling, or doing a shuffling or a permutation, and then count the number of outcomes just as we did with our norm, our norm value. We have a large number of, of simulated outcomes, and then we can compare one observed outcome to that and ask where in that simulated distribution does this lie? This is absolutely correct. This is perfectly fine statistics. Mathematically extremely simple. It's just a counting statistic. But of course, um, conceptually, not simpler than uh, applying any kind of a very refined statistical test. Uh, only now the conceptual burden goes into your simulation. But that's a lifesaver because you know a whole lot about that simulation. You can bring all your biological expertise into the simulation. You can say that I have a bias because um, many of my patients were smoking or um, this is a mouse strain that, is, that, is, that has a known risk factor for cardiovascular events, so I can take that into account. And then take anything that you know about your data, put it into a simulation, and then ask, what does the null distribution look like? These are things that, that you know, take creativity in and, and how to build your simulation, that take a lot of insight. Um, once you build your si si simulation and synthetic data, validate them well. But they will allow you to make quantitative statements about your data in situations where you simply know that using a standard statistical test will fail because standard statistical tests have assumptions that you can't guarantee about your data. Most importantly, almost all of them require independence of your observations. So here's an example. Um, <clears throat> assume you have a, a protein sequence. And now you would speculate that <clears throat> positively charged residues should be close to negatively charged residues in the protein sequence um, in order just to balance charge locally. So a statistic that could capture this is the mean minimum distance between all D and E residues and the closest um, R, K, and H residue. So let's take a protein sequence. This is a yeast transcription factor as a string, and I split this string into individual characters, so I have, um, we, we talked about sequence strings quite a lot. I've called this V here. So it's a character string, 833 characters of M, S, N, Q, and so on. And now I can, I can find position of my charged residues. E and D is I have 88 aspartic acid or glutamic acids in, in these positions here, um, arginine, lysine, and histidine. <clears throat> I have 125 of these in these positions here. And now I can calculate the minimum distances for all of the E and Ds. And um, put that into a vector, so the first E has the closest um, arginine, lysine, or histidine at five residues. The second one has the closest one at three. 
The third one has a neighboring arginine lysine or histidine. So now I would speculate that this number is smaller than I would expect by random chance because of local balancing. So um, so these are the minimum distances. 24 have adjacent residues. The largest distance I observe um, is a separation of 28, uh, well, and so on. So the mean separation here is 4.1. So on average, um, these, the, the, the separation between charged residues is 4.1 apart. Now, is this um, significant? I wouldn't even know how to begin to phrase a question like this properly into a statistical test. Lauren, what would you think? Do you think you could, you could, you could do this by you know, applying a hypergeometric distribution? Sure. I would have to think harder about it. Too. I think I would need to think really, really hard. <laughs> yeah. Much, much, much harder than, than my very poor background in statistics would, would make reasonable. But we can do this by simulation. We don't actually need to think. We can let the computer just try. And that's really easy to do. So first of all, we, we take whatever we've done above and combine that into a function so we can repeat it many times over. And you say significant, you mean here, what's your null hypothesis, right? Like what the four that you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. What's, what's, what's like the null hypothesis? So the, the null hypothesis is that, you know, in, a, in an observed biological difference, uh, in an observed biological sequence, this is different from a non biological sequence on which we had no evolutionary pressure. So how do I get a non-biological sequence of this kind? Well, I can take my original sequence and shuffle it. So I have the same, I don't have a bias from selection of more or less arginines or lysines, which is an important factor because you know, the denser they are, the, the, the less the mean distance becomes. Um, but all the correlation that actually says, you know, have, an, have evolutionary pressure on, on, on local separation, all that correlation would be lost because now I'm, sh I'm shuffling things. There's no, no biological meaning in distances anymore. So that would be my null hypothesis. Um, <clears throat> so that's my function. It just does exactly the same thing that, that I did before. I can execute it once on my, on my sequence vector, confirm that executed on my sequence vector it gives me the same result that, that I calculated before. And now, um, I can produce a random permutation of my vector. So of my vector v, I make a random permutation um, v and <coughs> get a vector w, which is now tkfn so it's different. It doesn't start with methionine anymore, but it has exactly the same amino acids. Therefore, exactly the same number of lysines, arginines, histidines, glutamic acids, and aspartic acids. And I can apply my function to that. And I find, OK, 3.273. So that's actually less than what I saw before. And um, so let's do this uh, 10,000 times. For n equals 10,000, I make myself a charge separation vector uh, of 10,000 numeric slots, and I repeat the whole thing 10,000 times. It takes a, a few seconds to compute, and I can look at the histogram. Now, this distribution here is my, corresponds to my null hypothesis. This is the, 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 the background distribution. If I have a sequence of that type, my underlying distribution of charge separations in a shuffled sequence looks like that. And so where's our, our um, observation here, the one we have in our actual biological MBP1 sequence? This lies here. So now 
I can interpret my hypothesis based on this observation. Contrary to my expectations, the actual observed mean minimum change se charge separation seems to be larger than what we observe in a randomly permuted sequence. I would have expected it to, to lie far on that side of the mean, i.e. whenever I have an arginine or a, a lysine, I would have an aspartic acid or um, a glutamic acid very close to it to balance the charges. That's not what actual sequences do. So it's, it's on that side. Now, is this significant? How do we now determine whether this is significant? Take the sum <coughs> of the probability of the histogram from 4 to mm -hmm. infinity, which is like the largest value, and divide it by the entire sum. I could do this for more proteins. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, when, I, when I go home on a Friday evening to <laughs> set it to start working on, on the human protein, proteome, one sequence after another, this takes about 10 seconds. And by the time that, that I've come back, uh, the 20,000 sequences would have been done. Um, the statistics that I would collect at that point is the significance that I calculate right now for every single sequence mm -hmm. because they're all different they all have different lengths and all, all uh, have different separations um, so calculating this for one I have um, this vector what was it CHS 10,000 samples uh, these are the values. We saw the histogram for that. And I have my single observation V. No, V is the sequence. What was my single observation? I'm slowly losing it here. Oh, well, simply the result of this here. Charge separation of V. Let's call this um, ops. Four point one. Okay. So how many are smaller or larger? What's the expression I need to write? I'd still be here tomorrow if I do that. Oh, yeah, I need to tell sum, R to count right. it. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Sum of What's the, name of the, vector? Uh, the vector was CHS greater than So 1188. What's that? What's that number say? You have to divide it by the, the by 10,000. Yeah. Right. That I can do by hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't have to. Or more generally, n. That's how I defined it. So 0.118. So relative to our plot, where, where does that number appear on, on, on the plot? Right, it's, it's all of the counts that correspond to these, to these columns of my histogram here. Or if I would uh, consider this to be a smooth curve, it would be the area under the curve um, on the right-hand side of the line. 
So in <clears throat> given this background distribution, I would expect um, to observe a value as different from the mean in a sequence of that composition in about 10% of the time. Is that significant? Not if you use the zero point like that. Like not, at the, not at the generally agreed upon cutoff. And if we then start saying approaching significance or <laughs> <laughs> almost significant, <laughs> there's, uh, there's, there's a very funny post somewhere where somebody actually collected um, from his experience as a referee uh, all the, the, the linguistic contortions that people were using to wheedle their way out of that. Their data was not actually significant. Um, that's very funny. So, not significant. So it's an, it's an intriguing result. It certainly seems to contradict our initial hypothesis that the charge separation is close. Um, perhaps if we do this more times we, on, on different sequences, we see a trend. Perhaps we see that that trend would be different from, from random if we average it over many, many um, observations. Um, but this one, in and of itself, perhaps would, would warrant further follow-up, but it is not in and of itself significant. Now, what you have to realize, however, if it weren't if the very same thing from just a few tweaks in the sequence would have turned out to be on the other side of 5%, it would not necessarily mean that you know, now we have to, to rethink our biology. We still need to follow this up. So we don't blindly trust your significance levels based on p-values. At least this very simple approach um, of permutation testing or simulation testing or in other way calculating empirical p-values allows us to make quantitative statements like that about biology that is, you know, otherwise very, very hard to, to understand. Um, now, in the second part of the script, um, I'm, I'm going through basic statistical tests like two to sample t tests um, and other things on the um, on the GSE data and basically illustrating what we're expecting here um, how we calculate t values of if we're comparing uh, events where we have three biological replicates and three biological replicates on the other side what this really means um, how we are certain to find absolutely highly significant things that are otherwise meaningless simply through repeating the test over and over and over again. Um, how we correct for that with something we call the Bonferroni correction or um, the false discovery rate. I, I hope that the script is relatively self-explanatory. It also introduces ideas of uh, uh, non-parametric tests. Um, if you're so inclined, um, study that. I'm, I, I think if I start going on about real statistics now, um, you're not going to have a good time. <laughs> just, just fall silently asleep. Um, I think I'll leave it off at that point. Um, you still have surveys to fill out uh, for the workshop, but for the formal teaching part, um, I will conclude by saying thank you, you've, you've learned a lot. I, I see it in your faces. I, most of you, I, I think, had a lot of fun doing this. Um, w if this was successful, then I was able to break down some barriers. I don't presume that I was able to teach you R, um, but I hope I was able to introduce you enough to learning R on your own so that you can continue doing it and explore it and, and simply enjoy it. I can't overstate how important it is to play. And R is fun to play with.
making pretty plots and finding odd correlations in, 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 in your data like that. I, I think that's quite satisfying. So uh, thanks a lot. I'll, I'll hand it over to Anne for uh, the last good words and uh, hope to see you again. And, and as I said in the last workshop, if you do have any questions about that material or you're stuck at some point, feel free to email me.